All right. <clears throat> hey, <laughs> everyone. Oh, yeah, 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 come in, yeah, no. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> this is the real, this is the actual person you're waiting for here today. Sorry. Our four minutes. Good to see you. All right. This is probably going to be a very, um, very nice discussion session here. Hey, have a seat. You're in the right room. <laughs> this is the place to be. <laughs> uh, uh, we can tell the friends about it afterwards. <laughs> okay, so um, we, I think so. Before we start, I guess we have a couple of things to clarify here. Um, no, but maybe first of all, I'm Pascal. Um, My name is Eric. Eric, and we are from uh, Steps. We work on Embark. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you probably noticed already that. The title of this talk here, Building EWAS and Devs with Embark V5, is a little bit different from what you see in your little DevCon application. Um, this is due to some reasons. Um, so basically, um, the description of the talk doesn't entirely match what we do here today because we have to change a little bit based on some time constraints. So um, yeah, we, we basically were, we were a two hour talk, a workshop, and then we got cut down to 40 minutes. <laughs> uh, we had to shuffle some things around, changing the movie basically. So out of the 10 points that we listed in the description, you might get maybe one or two. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and also that at the same time also change the format a little bit. So it's not really going to be a <coughs> workshop where you, you know, coach yourself. Um, it's more going to be like a little bit of a theory session and then afterwards we're going to demo some stuff and maybe walk you through some code and maybe have some questions um, and then uh, hopefully we have answers. Um, but just, yeah, just also clarify, our, our goal for this wasn't to, we're not experts on EYSM, so if you have EYSM questions, Sean will probably answer them, hopefully, he can try his best. Uh, our goal for this was to, to integrate the EYSM contract into Embark, so just to help developers be able to build contracts using EYSM essentially and deploy them using Embark. So that's what we can expect. Okay, um, any, any questions at this point? No? Okay, so then maybe like, yeah, first up, was anybody at the EYSM, EYSM, EYSM talk yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> it's either or All right. So we, we've been to that talk, and it actually turned out that um, you know there's a lot of things still in the making, and um, so so what we're going to show you today is you know stuff that works for the demo purposes, but is probably not like in a production-ready state. So just keep that in mind. Um, it's more more like a little bit of an exploration what we can do with with a mark and you know flexibility of APIs and so on. We, the main point there is that we want to show you how you can extend Embark to do just about anything you want, including some very, very experimental stuff like EYSM stuff, which we'll show you. All right, so here, just, just to give a little bit of an agenda of what we talk about today. So we talk about um, EYSM, just a little bit. Uh, then we're going to talk about the NIM programming language. Anybody heard about NIM before? Okay, that's good. That's, that's awesome. That means that everybody here is going to learn something new today. Um, and then there is a uh, very mysterious project called NimPlay, which actually enables us to write smart contracts in Nim. Uh, and then uh, and then we will show you a demo of how that works. Um, and then this is actually what's going to use you as eventually. And yeah, um, cool. All right. <clears throat> So let's start off with, uh, if you're a uh, web assembly, uh, or you wasn't in short, uh, I mean, you probably have heard, uh, heard about you wasn't before in some way, at least like the acronym, right? So you wasn't a restricted subset of web assembly to be used for smart contracts in Ethereum. And now, if, if you um, if you're like new to this stuff, um, or no experts or whatever, like we are, then uh, you might be wondering like, what what is web assembly actually in the first place. So. Um, WebAssembly, for those who don't know, is a, uh, a binary structure format for stack-based VM. So it's actually an open standard for the web um, that aims to uh, yeah, provide developers a um, like a, 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 an API um, in a way to 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 run very fast programs uh, and nearly native native speed. Um, 
It's very portable as well. So basically, you need to imagine um, you can you can write programs in any language that transpile to WebAssembly. So you will never write WebAssembly yourself. Um, it's, it's an assembly language after all. Um, and then computers are really good at translating that WebAssembly code to CPU instructions, which is why it turns out to be very fast. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So that in general about, about WebAssembly. And there's actually a couple of browsers that already ship that. I believe that Firefox already has a um, WebAssembly VM integrated, so we can run stuff from uh, WebAssembly in the browser today. Um, so this is basically <coughs> WebFit. <clears throat> so what that means in, 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 in practice, you have your, your source code. Um, uh, turn it to, into uh, WASM code in some way. You know, um, there must be some sort of transpiler or compiler for it. And then, um, ideally, since you have this WASM code, you can run it on different CPU architectures because you know they can translate that code easily. Um, which also means that that code is very portable. Um, that's a good thing. Obviously, there's generally a uh, textual format and a binary format. So the textual format is like the assembly code that you can actually read as a human being. Again, this is not the code that you would actually write, it's the code that you can, the, the code that you can actually inspect and, and that you output eventually. Um, and then this is the binary version of that, that so you can execute. You could write it if you wanted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be pretty, pretty cool if you could do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so coming coming back to it wasn't so that that we know like that we have like a rough idea of what WebAssembly is. Uh, <coughs> so it wasn't is a restricted subset of WebAssembly. Um, so I'm not actually sure if the wording is quite correct. Um, but maybe maybe um, Jack has some ideas on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, Essentially, what that would mean is that if you write the Wasm code, it's automatically also valid Wasm code because it's a, it's, it's a subset. Um, but you know, what does it mean a restricted subset? So there's obviously there's some very specific semantics to eWasm that make eWasm what it is um, compared to web, web assembly. And, and there, there are a couple of things. So um, we have a. Uh, can I open this here? Yeah, looks good. So the, there, um, the the. Ewasm VM kind of like comes with like certain yeah semantics specific for for Ethereum. Um, I mean we, we don't have to read this here, but there's the, there's this uh, Ethereum WebAssembly website um, with all sorts of resources about uh, Ewasm. Um, so so basically, what makes your Ewasm code Ewasm code is the environment that runs it eventually because it comes with certain semantics that also includes um, things like a uh, it wasn't contract interface, um, basically an interface that allows you to have wasm code that knows how to talk to um, like contract, smart contract APIs, um, and a couple of other things. Oh, sorry, there you go. There's also um, built-in system contracts. Um, if you look at that, it's quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure how up to date that still is, but um, there's uh, like a central central contract, EVM transpiler, transcompiler contract. Um, so, like different addresses that are already available in that environment that your code runs in, um, that could also mean that, for example, you know, you have like certain functions, like uh, you know, the hash function, functions and stuff as contracts. That's how I understand it. That you can call them from your own contracts um, within that environment again, right? So this is obviously stuff that would not be in in uh, plain WebAssembly available. You have that in, in your in your it wasn't environment. <coughs> Coming back to the semantics, um, non-deterministic behavior, basically, you know, removing floating points from that environment, um, and then there's this metering system, which is kind of like the new gas. So in a way, like E wasm is wasm uh, minus the non-deterministic behavior, and then plus the metering, plus some system contracts. And does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't. You can ask John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, please feel free, I guess, to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, about yeah. yeah. Um, Don't be shy. We, we're very uh, open, open um, yeah, format. <coughs> There's a question. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. there. If, if the performance of WebAssembly is close to native, what's the point of using system contracts that are hard coded? Like the 
by the pre -compose. So the, the reason for it at this time is basically the, the eWASM team wasn't able to make it this fast. And also because of gas costs, they mispriced it. So if you go look at how much a SHA-256 or a SHA-3 costs you and you had to implement them in WebAssembly raw, it would be mispriced. Okay. Yeah, so you'd suddenly be spending like 10 times more gas. Than, than. So that was kind of what, just, just to add to that, what, yeah. what the talk was about, uh, as Pascal was referring to, is basically uh, using pre-compiles and using uh, optimized interpreters, the speed of Basically, Ethereum one is just as is just as fast as eWASM. That's a non non optimized eWASM. That's how I understood it. So, at this point in time, they're using pre compiles and optimized interpreters to get really fast speeds. But <coughs> eWASM will be faster. <coughs> so, what I understood right now that when we write a smart contract, we compile it. We will have byte code, or let's say binary code, not binary code, it's in between. The EVM is going to interpret that code. However, the eWASM is an embedded code that's going to be compiled to be native code. It means to me that there is a hacking to the virtual machine itself that should run that code, which means that when it reaches the area of the native code, it's going to start executing it. Is this correct? Um, so at this time, it's not a compiled. It's still interpreted, huh. if that answers the question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's what they were talking about in the talk yesterday. Um, there are certain problems with using like a compiled uh, VM, uh, especially like security concerns with, uh, like, for instance, a JIT bomb, if it's a JIT-based uh, one. So. Actually, cool you're bringing this up because the next slide is kind of like visualizing this a little bit. Um, so, uh, from a, from a classical standpoint of view, like the the way the way we like build DApps today um, with like you know Solidity and stuff. So, for example, we have our Solidity code. We run it through Solidity compiler, and then you get an ABI and a bytecode, and then eventually the bytecode is is what ends up uh, in the VM, right? That's what you know, like upload to the chain um, and lets you like talk to your to your contract instance. Um, actually, very similar is, is what happens with eWASM as well. So, you, it's just that instead of writing your code in Solidity, although you can write it in Solidity too, it doesn't really matter as long as it transpiles to eWASM eventually. Um, so, you, you have your code. At this point, you can use like C, C, Rust, or NIM, um, which we touch on in a second. Um, you get your eWASM code out of that, and then you know that's going to get run inside of that eWASM environment. Um, you still get an ABI code as well, so it's not in the, in the graphic right now, but you get the idea. So, from a like flow point of view, it's kind of like still the same process, you're just dealing with a different language and a different format. So, it wasn't itself, it, it will run directly in the EVM. Uh, so, you'll, you'll, it will be dual, dual stack. So, like at, at the point that they visualized this, it would be that you have a marker when you deploy, um, and it will know it's USM, and then it will run a dual stack via and switch between. I'm not talking about deployment, I'm talking about compilation. So eWASM should be compiled to be understood by the yes. EVM. Uh, well, by the, um, yeah, so that it, it's yeah, like, so, it's, it's, it, the, it's, it's just actually another WASM runtime, if that makes sense. Can I, okay, so from C to eWASM, there is a, uh, some sorts of compilation. Yes. That's going to generate um, a code that could be understood by the EVM. Well, the, 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 the WASM, it's still a WASM runtime um, that has EVM hooks in as functions. Um, I can show you later as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. We can uh, yeah. we'll do it all down for you. Good questions, uh, thank you. Thank you. Good answers as well. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in continuation to uh, that, uh, in a different perspective, can we call that uh, in a WebAssembly uh, native uh, runtime, uh, we have a metering library or something that uh, the uh, talks to? Talking yes. in a different perspective. Yeah, so because that is the missing piece, right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, if you look earlier in the slide, there was um, about uh, the, the, the metering currently gets injected, but you could still do the metering inside the interpreter as well, which is what I would prefer, but they decided to inject the metering. So it could be still treated as a, a 
package of library that it talks to on the Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right, so eventually what that means, um, given what we've just learned, <laughs> the benefits of using uh, eWASM would be, first of all, you can actually write your, your smart contracts in any language. Anything that transpiles or compiles eWASM, um, which is kind of cool, because then you don't, you're not necessarily uh, just tied to Solidity or Viper or whatever. Um, so originally, it's going to be a fast execution. Um, there's also better library support, because, you know, it, since, since you can use any language, you probably um, can take advantage of a very big ecosystem of, of libraries and plugins that your language um, supports. Um, and then, after all, there's also a big community since Wasm is an open standard, so um, we have a lot of people to talk to about this stuff that uh, can help you as well. All right, so <laughs> given that, we, we will touch a little bit on one language um, uh, called NIM. That's the thing that nobody has heard about here. <laughs> uh, and also there's another expert here uh, in that language. Um, and, and so NIM is just yet another language that that can transpile or compile to, to eWASM. So it's it's one potential candidate for you to write your smart contracts in the future. Um, so what is NIM? NIM is a statically typed compiled systems programming language. If you look at the language, and we'll see some code in a minute, it looks a little bit like a mix of, I would say, like JavaScript, Python, you like smash it together and then maybe put a little bit of yeah, maybe TypeScript in there as well. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that NIM uh, it aims to be very expressive and elegant, uh, and, you know, have a very intuitive syntax. Um, and it aims for native performance as well. So if you if you look at the, the website, the official website here, um, there's this features section and you may also see already some code there. Uh, but basically um, it, it you know, it claims that it has native performance with state-of-the-art optimization. So the, the point here is that um, NIM actually also uh, compiles to, to like C code, um, which means you, know, you can run <coughs> C code through a C compiler, and you know, those are really, really optimized these days because there's like four years of experience going in there. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that, that's a pretty good thing, I guess. So yeah, um, that's why we have here, you know, translation targets like possible ones are C++, JavaScript, it wasn't, um, even JavaScript, so, so that's also pretty cool. Like if you, if you like to build web applications but you don't like JavaScript, you know, or TypeScript, or whatever, you could, you could use NIM, you know, that's your, that's your, uh, your gem. And what's also really cool about the language itself, um, which, is, which is kind of like a key point here of this whole thing, is that um, it supports meta programming using generics and macros. Um, now, why is that interesting? So, first of all, some some NIM code just to get a general idea of what the language looks like, right? Python, JavaScript, smash it together. <laughs> it looks kind of like that with some weird um, indentation syntax as well. I think uh, if you're not used to that, it looks weird first. But I think uh, yeah, it's, you know, just a matter of getting used to it. Um, so you see there's like different things like iterators and you can create your own types and object structures and there's import statements as well. You know, um, if you've used any other language, you should probably get an idea of what this stuff here means. Um, so now, but macros, um, you know, being one feature of that language, um, has anybody used macros before in any other language? Yeah, over there, from other people, <laughs> handful of people. Also. Okay, so for those who don't know, special functions that execute at compile time, so you can basically define uh, functions that expand to the language that you're using, and that expansion happens at compile time. Um, and that essentially enables you to um, create custom uh, domain-specific languages, um, which is a very, very powerful thing. And uh, yeah, so here's uh, probably not the best example. You don't have to read and understand this code. I, I really, just took it from the website, just to give an example of what a macro could look like in them. This is a debug macro, um, and you, you see like you define it with a macro keyword and then you know you, you give it some some uh, some logic and tell it what to do. Um, and eventually once you've defined a macro you can you can like call it like that. So we, we define an array here, a string and, and then we, we pass it to that function. So it looks like a normal function at this point. So you might wonder like what's the 
point, really. Um, you can just use the functions for that. Um, but then it turns out you, you can actually go, go way beyond that again, like if we, if we come back to the, um, the idea of creating a DSL, custom language, that with, your, you know, with its own semantics, um, that gets very powerful. And there's, there's this project um, that this guy is working on. <clears throat> it's called NimPlay. And NimPlay is, is exactly that. Um, right? it, it, it takes the, the power of macros and it creates a DSL. Um, for, for smart contracts. Uh, again, keep in mind, like, NIM transpiles to, to EWASP as well, so you basically get smart contracts in NIM that you can trans transpile to EWASP and then um, essentially. So, right, NIMPlay is a domain specific language for running smart contracts uh, using NIM macros. Uh, again, given what we've learned before, uh, essentially that means NIMPlay is just a set of macros. Uh, and uh, yeah, it takes care of like expanding it to to new, new code. <clears throat> All right, so uh, another cool visualization. Uh, so you, you write your new play contracts. Um, they get expanded to new code. So you, actually, you you write new, but you use the the, the macro syntax. Um, you expand it to the actual new code. At, again, at compile time, macros are executed at compile time. That code, um, so that's just to make it you know, your contract more writable, right? It's going to look more familiar to you and easier to write your contracts in NIM play than it would be to write them in NIM by itself. So it's kind of like a convenience feature. Yeah. Right, and so once we uh, expanded that to NIM, again, the, the whole you know, process uh, starts all over. So you transpile to EWASM from there, um, you know, it, it ends up with be. <clears throat> and again, you know, just just to stress it once more, like essentially, this could work with any language that transpiles to EWASM, and, and you know, ideally, it supports something like macros, like Rust, for example. It's the same thing. Uh, and he, here's a here's a sample code. Um, this is our our go-to example for for like a very simple smart contract that simply stores a value, you know, simple storage, like sets and gets a value. Um, this is this is a simple storage contract written in NIMPLAY, essentially. Um, so just that, that you get an idea. Like, there are probably some things here that you know, uh, don't really, you know, the, I think the main functions of construct is not really supported at this point. Um, so you can like, in our demo that we'll show, this is not gonna be there, but just so you get an idea. Yeah, take some pictures, it's good. <laughs> but, but really, the, the, the important thing to look at are the first two methods. That, Set and get. I mean, when you're doing a set, you're just setting a global variable, store data to whatever your value is, and when you do a get, you just get that value. So imagine this is a contract employed uh, in Ethereum. You'd be just calling the set method to, to set a value in the contract and going to get. So you'd be sending a set, uh, a set transaction and calling the get to get your value out. It's very simple, and we're going to show you this demo. Is the main here representing the constructor of the smart contract? Uh, well, we don't have, we, I haven't done the constructor part yet because it requires the deployment transaction to be, to be built. So um, the main is usually hit, the, the actual entry point is usually hit, just like Solidity or Viper, you would just have a, uh, we'll probably change the syntax to say specifically this constructor. Um, it still never works that way. Like main is a bad word to use for constructor, so I'll be able to check. Yeah. <laughs> and in Solidity, we don't have entry point. Uh, Except yes, we don't. We, you just pick, it's kind of the, in Solidity we don't have an entry point because of the way the language, uh, the, the EVM works, that it just starts executing from the beginning. But in WASM we have an entry point, uh, which is like usually the main, the main function. Yeah, like a main export function. <laughs> Okay, cool. So, um, so that, now there's this thing. Uh, <coughs> small problem. Small problem. Spoiler alert. Uh, so, um, you know, if you if you take a look at the installation instructions, and if you happen to run other machines than mm, MacBooks, for example, uh, installation of of NimPlay can be um, can be a little bit hard. Uh, so there's like this whole process that you have to go through. 
And um, now, to kind of like draw the line um, back to Embark, you know, the, the tool that we work on. Who's, who's used Embark before? Who's heard about Embark before here? Who's not heard about Embark before? <laughs> wow, okay, that's really cool. Check out Embark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think this, is, this is really good for you to be here. By the way, we have 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes left? Yeah. Okay, then we're ready to get going. All right, so. Um, so basically, um, what we want to do is 15 minutes. Sorry. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, I'm going to slow down a little bit. So since this setup is, is kind of hard to do, um, we we want to help with Embark, which um, we're going to dive into in a second. Um, it's basically a tool that helps you building your centralized applications. So when you write your smart contracts, you want to uh, compile them, deploy them, and test them. You, know, you want to have your, your front end you know, that talks to them and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, like Embark is a tool, it's like, like a tool belt if you want, that gives you like all of the different features that you need to, to make that process very easy. And one thing that comes with it is, is basically a uh, plugin ecosystem and a plugin API that enables you and us, but also you, um, to extend Embark and its features. And so you can basically also create a, a, a plugin that you know, uses them. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of an idea what Embark looks like, it's a command line tool. If you run it on your command line uh, in an Embark project, you get like this dashboard that tells you here are the contracts that, that we're compiling and deploying. Uh, you get like logging outputs, and, uh, you know, transaction hashes and gas costs and everything. So it's like your, you know, it's like a whole um, like you know, cockpit view into your uh, dev development. You have Web3 in that REPL? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good point. There's actually there's a REPL in there. Yes, you can interact with your contract contracts through that interface as well. You get top level await as well, which is pretty nice. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, this is Michael over there. It's another part. Sorry, I took the wrong train. <laughs> <laughs> or the train going in the opposite direction. So I should we say. have the father of a here as well, Yuri, and there's Richard, another team member, so you can talk to all of us. Uh, speaking of cockpit, there's also a web interface that comes with Embark. So when you uh, run your project with Embark, you, you can basically it, it spins up for you a web server with uh, with cockpit, which is our web UI that basically lets you intend the same way, but in a which in a bit, bit more rich way, I would say. You still have a REPL there in the web. Yes. Uh, it's kind of like what you get on the CLI, <laughs> just on steroids. Uh, all right. So, and then again, there, there's plugins like Embark has, has tons of plugins. Um, people can build plugins. There's an API. You can build your own plugins. You have plugins for uh, Remix, Etherscan, Slither, Snarks, um, MythX. Yeah, MythX. There's like tons of stuff. Um, <coughs> again, you can build your own. We have docs here. So, if you, if you, in case you haven't heard about Embark before, so go to embark.status.im, uh, and then there, there's like a, you know, we put a lot of time making our documentation as good as possible. So there's lots of docs about how to do things like creating plugins and stuff. Um, and so yeah, so getting back to the point, what what how, how cool would it be if we could use a mark and new play and create a plugin that makes this whole process easy so that you can actually go ahead and write your smart contracts in a language like NIM. <clears throat> Ideally, it would look something like this, right? So like step one, you would install the packages, you would install a mark, you would create a new project with it, there's a new command, right? A mark new my project. You would CD into it, you would install a plugin, something like Embark NIM compiler, for example. You configure it, and then you're done. Uh, in an ideal world. <laughs> and I'm very happy to tell you that Eric is going to present you that. Ideal world. Uh, in a second. By the way, this is like how what the plugin configuration could look like. Um, there's an Embark JSON file coming with every Embark project. Um, if you have other plugins, usually they come with their own custom properties that you can configure them. In this case, we don't even need to do configure any any, any configuration here. And uh, yeah, we go over to Eric. All right. Okay. So I am going to show you a dem demo first. Um, I'm going to show you the demo first, and then with the remaining time, we'll kind of dig into like some of the internals, but. Um, <coughs> And then, and then, if there are any questions as we go. Um, one thing I forgot to do before this. Bear with me. Some of this is going to take a little while, so I've got my elevator music on cue. 
All right, so, um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, if you saw before, there was an embark CLI command, embark, what was it before? It was embark new. So we're going to run, we're going to do embark run. That's actually going to spin up our dad. So I'm just going to do embark run. Oh, yeah, so. Is that maybe too much? How's that? Good. So what this is going to do is it basically spins up uh, all the services that we need to run our DAP. So just get back over here for a second. So you can see, before, like uh, like Pascal showed in the slides, here's our dashboard, um, and this is basically starting up. Uh, it's starting up a node for us, a local node. It's starting up any storage services that we might need, which we don't need. Starting up any like communication services like Whisper, which we don't need. Uh, ENS services as well. Again, we don't need that for this demo, but it'll do that all for us based on our configuration for the DAP. So, as you can see, what it's also done after starting up the node is it's deployed our contracts for us. Uh, well, it's if you look at the top here, it's deployed the simple storage one. This is our Solidity contract, so the top one. Now, the one underneath it is the exact same thing written in NIM. Okay, so the code that we saw before, the simple storage written in NIM, that's this guy, and it's just taking a little while to deploy uh, because it's just it's on test net. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we do have uh, we we have connected. We are connected to the, yeah. We are connected to our own little private thing. No problem. No, I'm pretty sure it's the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. It's got to be the, the Wi-Fi. I mean, it has to be the Wi-Fi, right? You can try it once again, otherwise we can switch to it. Try it once again, then otherwise we can switch to Microsoft. Yeah. So the EWAS and testnet currently is very small. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of nodes, and uh, you know things can go wrong. So yeah. it's one of the downsides of this right now, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that EWAS is undergoing a lot of changes. Anybody go to the EWAS and workshop yesterday? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, did you guys already talk about that? Okay, never mind. <laughs> That's what happens when we take a late train, man. <laughs> I took the wrong train. <laughs> that was the problem. Thank you. So you can see also, uh, it's smart enough to know if our contracts are deployed already, so it's time to try to deploy them. And we can wait this again. Maybe in the meantime, you can maybe open this to show the new contract. Yes. Oh, right. So yeah, show, 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 show the code. Showing the code. Up, up, deploying, come on. <laughs> okay, so just to quickly show you the file system of our DAP. Oh, this is actually not uh, DAP. Just give me a sec. I want to let this deploy so I don't mess this up. All right, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> it does like five mil. It doesn't. Yeah, I'm running like most of them. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it works! Hey, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All right, so let's check it out. So basically, you can see here we've got a web server that's spun up. This is for our front end, this is for, for the DAP, and also we have a web server started for Cockpit. That was the screenshot that Pascal showed you before. So if you want to go into the back end of things and see how things are, things are working, like all the services are working and <coughs> interact with them, you can do that using this link, but we're not going to do that today. We're just going to look at the front end of our demo, which is a really, really small React demo. Uh, I've got a few from open already, but so come on, <laughs> green lights. Hey, 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 all right, all right, all right. Okay, so it's, it's slow on testnet, consuming the on that as well. Oh yeah, zoom, zoom, zoom. All right. So we have two tabs here. One is for the Solidity contract, which is this one that's showing right now. And then we have the NIM contract. So we're just interacting with two different contracts. Uh, this is all using uh, it, what Embark does in the background is it code generates an object for us, like a contract object, that we can then call methods inside of the contract. So for example, uh, we get a value uh, that's stored. If you guys remember what the contract looks like, just getting a value that's stored in the contract. Our current value is 100. So if we then change that to 3, we can set. Uh, that will eventually get set. It's just a bit slow because it's on test end. 
<laughs> so at some point it's going to change. Um, so we have other music in. Um, so I have a question. Yes. Is it because you're using the block you don't need to look at the side transactions and stuff? Yes. That is a good question. You, yeah, so the question is like, do you not need to use MetaMask to sign transactions? Uh, and the way BARB works uh, right now is you can configure wallet accounts inside of your configuration for your dApp. Uh, so when you want to go uh, create a transaction on the front end, instead of signing a transaction using MetaMask, Embark, it'll actually send the transaction through Embark's proxy. Embark will pick it up and say, hey, you're trying to send this transaction. Is this, a, is this from an account that Embark controls in the wallet? If it is, then of course we have access to the private key and we can sign the transaction. In development. In development. Very important. I mean, you know, Embark kind of like becomes your wallet at that point. So this this was working. This is promise. <laughs> this is a solidity one. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but you can imagine that the value usually is set, and you can call it. You can be able to one. Let's try the new one. Oh, that's a good sign. Says mining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> I'm trying your key. <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, let's show the code. I'll show the code while he's setting this up. So, <laughs> basically, this is. Uh, oh, sorry. You know what I need to do? So this is the contract that we're looking at, but I'm going to show you the, the file system a little bit first. So if you look at the top level of our file system, uh, there's a few components here. Uh, we, have, we have our front end stuff in under app. We've got our configuration files under config, contracts under contracts, uh, our dist obviously, which is our built front end. Um, the only other thing you need really need to see here is the embark JSON. So what's cool about this? You can see where our plugin is set up. Okay, so we've got this plugin here. This option is, we don't actually need it, but uh, again, as Pascal was mentioning, you can add any custom options for your custom plugins here. So don't worry about that one for now, but you can just see that we have the Embark in compiler plugin set up. That's how you install it. So once you NPM install it into your app, you just enable it using by putting it as, a, as an object of plugins. So in our contracts, we've got our simple storage Solidity contract. So the constructor accepts a value and sets stored data to that value. And then we can also do uh, the same thing with set. So we can actually set the stored data value to wherever we pass in. And then the get, we just pull it out. Nothing crazy. Um, and looking at name, it's exactly the same thing. So. Uh, we can set a value using this set function, get the value using the get function. Um, quickly looking at config, uh, I mean, there's configuration for blockchain, so if you, how you want to configure your node and, and any of those accounts, like those wallet accounts we were talking about earlier. Uh, so you can basically add in the mnemonic and sign transactions that way. Um, communications for things like Whisper, if you want to add a Whisper to your, we have three minutes left. I'm, I'm good, I'm good. How are you doing? Just get through the things, man. Just get through the things. Alright, so there's not a whole lot to, to look at in these. I mean, uh, I don't want to get into it because once you start looking at it, it's a lot to see. So, um, Any burning questions? I guess maybe. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so I'm just wondering is it possible currently for this simple storage name contract to read, you know, like just for Simplicity, the storage of the solidity written one. Like, how do these two be? Yeah, so the currently the test net doesn't feel stuck. So you know, no, no, okay, currently. But I think the idea, of, well, at the point of when they made it was that you could switch, and then yes, you'll be able to read the same story. Especially when you when you think about like um, you're gonna have to hard fork at some point, and then you'd have to run both VMs. So you'd have to. That sounds hard. <laughs> <laughs> Is this, it's, it's, yes. Sorry, and uh, Pascal is going to show you just quickly in the last two minutes we have. But it actually does not work. It is just a full network. 
works. Uh, <laughs> promise it works. Uh, it's good that you stay because there's like one thing that you you might be interested in during the talk. So. stay here. All right. You can see this? Wonderful. So you see there's this message your value set to 100. I did not just code it in there right now. I actually set the value and now I'm going to, so this is the NIM contract right now. I set the value to, to 100. I'm going to call get value. Let's see how long that's been. Oh, and get value. Can we change it? Can we change it? Yeah, let's do that. Well, should we get a, <laughs> get a number from the audience? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number, any number. <laughs> 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 there was no clue. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, any other numbers? No, no, no. Get the, get the value first. Oh, yes. <laughs> we don't need it. Let's get another number. Yeah. 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 Thanks for warming them up here. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, you see, this works. Um, uh, any, so what any, is the version of Embark that is oh, running in? Good point. This is a, a custom development version that um, you don't have right now. Now, if you install, um, like at this point, it's, it's a version that's like latest master yeah, okay. and running on. Yeah, you can see all the deployments. Yep. Yeah. So these are the two value changes. And then, so if you go on recent transactions, you can see where the contract was deployed. And you guys have tested it. Just here. And then the two set functions that he called one earlier when you weren't looking, and then he called the one of 100. Actually, sorry, it was 100 and 101 for one. Yeah, and um, going go on the transaction and then forwarding on the contract. Uh, you can hear. It's it's quite cool. You can play, uh, you can even browse the data. Uh, you you will all on the contract to the two, the two address, the 49. OX49. OX49. Yeah, yeah. And then your storage tab. Oh, cool. Yeah, so this is actually cool because we can some of the things that we've discussed before. So here you can see setting the value, um, and then it, this is zero because it's the, the first variable in the contract. So you just increment the values, and then if you check the, the last code, where I can share someone asked about the, uh, the gas injection, uh, you can uh, scroll down and you'll see this is the calls mm -hmm. currently of how the how the injection works. So they do a single pass. And they check these, and then basically, if your contract fails here, yeah, they just like total all the used gas. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, then, uh, I have a question. Yes, that is because you don't want to write your own uh, interpreter, or? Uh, so, uh, it was, uh, I don't know why they did it specifically, but I think it's because they, they wanted to test all the Wasm inter uh, interpreters and compile time. Uh, available, and not all of them exposed them to to do for the accounting. So doing it this way allowed them to test all of them. You, you found a star. <laughs> <laughs>